two, one. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for having me. I yes. appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Um, obviously, I want to talk about like the main the main subject of like addiction and what it does to the brain and all mm -hmm. the problems that are, uh, our country's experiencing, especially our state in New Mexico. But I'll be honest, we were talking about a little beforehand. I am shocked to find out you love cigars. <laughs> I am fucking shocked. That is amazing. I can't tell any of the cardiologists I work with. <laughs> So I get, I get very nervous. I'm like, oh no, they're C gonna know I smoke cigars. Cigars do not hurt the heart. They do not hurt the lungs. They don't even hurt your gums, from what I've been told. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. They're the voices in my head, but that's what they <laughs> tell me as I'm enjoying my favorite cigars. I I will say I was not very good at smoking cigars when I first started. Nobody is. And so I did get nicotine poisoning the first time that I smoked a cigar, and I have to say that was not super fun. I turned green. What? Okay. Oh, so you you didn't just get dizzy and puke. Oh, like no, you got actual. Green. How old were you? Holy. This was shit. last year. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So why? Okay, I've heard of actual nicotine poisoning, but I've never like talked to someone who's actually experienced that. What What is happening when that happens? Like, oh man. Um, from what I remember, so I, I had, I remember when I was younger, like my dad, and then we grew up in Europe. And my dad is from Europe, and so he was very much like, yeah, you can have a little bit of, like, sips of alcohol. You can right. have a little bit of the cigar. Well, that's the culture over there. Yeah, very much. And personally speaking, I think they have it right. Like, I, I think they have... I would never... I don't condone underage drinking or anything mm -hmm. like that. Everyone fucking does it, but I don't condone it. <laughs> but what I will say is having... And I think this is, almost goes for any any substance, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are left or right limits to this, but with stuff like alcohol, if you are exposed to it at, like... 15, 16, 17, 18, and like, hey, yeah, a bottle of beer here, about a glass of wine here or there, yeah. but with family in a controlled environment rather than keeping it this mysterious liquid that like, what happens when I drink it? Do I suddenly become attractive? I've heard about <laughs> confidence. What is that? And then you go out, make a stupid decision at a house party. You know, you drive drunk as, an, as a teenager, yeah. which is a huge problem in the state. So I think the Europe for all the faults, the Europeans got it right. You know, I have to say I agree with you. I think too, my family made a lot of beer and liquor and things like that. So I was part of the process of making it. So I got to appreciate it on another level. But I think that what I really liked about it was it wasn't something taboo. It wasn't something scary. And I never felt the need to drink to get drunk. It was more to enjoy the actual taste of the liqueur that we were drinking or a nice glass of wine. And I remember when I was really younger, it was almost like a form of respect from my family of here. They used to give me a glass of wine because they're like, you're part of your, you're part of the family. You can enjoy in these things. And they gave me a little glass of wine and they would pour a little bit and then fill the rest with water. And it was great because I felt like I was part of the adult table and I was respected like one of the like a, one of the adults like a little rite of passage mm -hmm. but i do remember when i was younger my dad would take whiskey and he would rub it on my gums if my teeth were hurting or something like that and no that is just some 1920 gums. shit right there <laughs> so do you know what <laughs> do you know what polinka is no so i'm hungarian and my family's hungarian oh shit and there's a drink called polinka and it is i think 160 proof <laughs> it literally means a slap in the face and sometimes in the morning my my dad would take a little sip of the polinka and he would be like, all right, I'm awake now. <laughs> yeah, so that makes sense. Jesus. Like, Do you want to try a little bit? And I think I was 12. And so he literally puts them on his finger and like rubbed it on my gums. And I just remember thinking it was like gasoline. I was like, oh. <laughs> Holy shit. But yeah, it was. Uh, what is it? Like, what is it? Is it comparable to anything outside of just straight? Gasoline. Ca yeah, kerosene and <laughs> ethanol. It's honestly, I just remember when we would open up the bottle, I just, like, my eyes would sting a little bit from the ethanol. <laughs> Hungarians go hard. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But, um, I mean, it was, it was never, it was never a big deal because it wasn't there to be abused. It was there to enjoy with family. And so. Or to um, wake up in the morning. Yeah. Or to so, wake up in yeah, the morning. Yeah, to wake up in the morning so you can enjoy your family. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> uh, a lot of Hungarians do it. Uh. And it's kind of a, my dad would always say it's a cultural thing. And I was like, okay, sure. Okay. My fucking work phone <laughs> oh, <you're good>. is, <laughs> you know, 
I've said this enough on the podcast, so for anyone listening has already heard this, I'm sorry. But yeah, so I'm a recruiter for a security company. And I don't know what compels people to call the recruiter of anything at, what, almost 6.30 at night? There is nothing I can do for you. I, I, I can actually guarantee it. There's nothing I can do for you. And I like, and I get like a little irritated when that happens now, just because like I worked in, um, I worked in caregiving as a manager, like as part of like management teams and shit. That's hard. Yeah. I, well, it, it was easier just because I was management. So mm-hmm. I was more like on the overhead type of things, but yeah, those weekends, like I was not weekends really the last three years or so that I was, well, two and a half that I was on call, you know, I would just be enjoying my time having a good night or maybe I was in the middle of a podcast and then and I'm like there's no way not right now and then of course like hey I'm not coming to work click I'm like fuck (laughs) okay (laughs) thanks man anyway anyway so did you were you born in in Hungary I'm proud to announce that the podcast is now officially sponsored by the fine people over at chop chili company Guys, this is some of the best chili you can get here in the state of New Mexico, and they are online as well as in stores. They can be found at Smith's, Albertson's, Sprouts, John Brooks, and Lowe's Corner Market. They have three amazing flavors that you see here, and they also have frozen green chili that you can get online. Go on over to the website, chopchiliCo.com, and get yourself some amazing chili today. So I was born in the States, but I'm a a dual citizen. My father is from Hungary, and he came to the States during the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. Oh, fuck me. Yeah, it was was, uh, interesting growing up with a dad who had been through war, and he was in a concentration camp. And um, I didn't realize until I was older that there are certain things that we do that are not normal. Like, we've always had a stash of special types of, like, canned foods in the garage and, like, tons of water because my dad has always been in that mode of okay we have to prepare when for it the kicks worst. off yeah right. and so it was interesting I, I just recently was talking to somebody about that and that realization of oh you guys you guys don't do that like or like having a we always we always have backpacks that are full of stuff so if we need to leave right away like we have blankets and jackets and protein bars and they're just sitting in the garage well in all fairness everyone should have that yeah but uh, we were talking about a little bit earlier, like Western privilege. Like mm-hmm. it's not something people think about. Yeah, but everyone should do that. If you turn on the news at any point of the day ever now, that should compel you to do that. Yeah, that's how old's your father now? He just turned eighty. Holy shit! So I have an I have an older dad. Um, so that was also interesting growing up. But to well, answer he, your question, um, born in the states, I did go to high school in Italy, which was a wonderful experience. My mother is Italian. And so I, and then we would go to Hungary when I was younger and see family and, uh, we have a house there, which is wonderful. So that's awesome. That's crazy. Yeah. So going to high, so did you do, so all of like six, seven, eight, eighth grade? I was in Santa Fe. Okay. So here in the States. I was here in the States and then I was here for the beginning of high school and then I went to Italy and then I came back for my senior year, which was really interesting to come back to. That's got to be str- what, Was there a major culture shock there compared oh, yeah. to how the Europeans do things? And so what was the major difference? It, it's funny because I was used to, after school, our professors, and this was in, uh, in high school, our teachers or professors would go with us to a bar. We called it we just called it bar (laughs) and it was a bar down the street from the school and we would sit and have a glass of wine with our professors and I don't smoke cigarettes but most of the kids did and so they would sit drink wine smoke cigarettes with our teachers from the high school I think that was how old were your teachers I'm um a range between I guess mid-20s to like 50 or 60 so kind of like America in in that way but they were like obviously way cooler and I'm sure they were treated a bit better it, I think I don't know too much from the teacher point of view, but yeah. we were in an IB program, so International Baccalaureate. Okay. So it's kind of like the first two years of high school are just building up for the second two years of high school. And then you take these big exams at the end of high school. And those are your IB exams. Interesting. So it was, a, it was a little different. But yeah, there's definitely some culture shock. I was in a boarding school. So I didn't have my family readily available to me. I mean, I had family in Hungary and I had some in Southern Italy, but I was in Rome. So it was 
central. But uh, a lot of independence. It was great. It was a great experience. You had to grow up quick. You do have to grow up uh, a little bit faster, I feel like, in boarding school. Because not that we were left alone, but there was a couple moments where I was like, oh, I got to... Can't nope. rely and run to my family right now. Right. No, there's a lot of liberty with that. I didn't go to boarding school in Rome, but <laughs> uh, well, me and and Joey, uh, we we went to military school down in Roswell. And How was that? It was I, okay. So we have two very different experiences. I fucking loved it. I thought it was cool. I mean, okay, I'll take that back. I'm I loved it. I, I definitely have, and I've recognized this now as I've talked to, I've had a lot of my friends that have come on the podcast that have went to school with me, and that's how we mm-hmm. met and got close. I recognize now that I have a little bit of rose-colored glasses when I look back on it, but even like the shittiest that it got, I still wouldn't take it back for anything. But the reason I bring it up is being in that boarding school setting, you do have a lot of liberties with your time. There is no such thing as 100% supervision. Uh-huh. And yep. you're a bunch of fucking 14, 15, 18 year olds running around wild. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's a thing. But that, again, that can either depend on what type of person you are in the environment you're in. That can either, you know, make you chaotic and weird or that can make you grow up a little bit quicker. Still be a little chaotic and weird. But, you know, it that's what it did for me is it really like forced me to like, yeah, I can't really call my family. They're three hours mm-hmm. away, but... I mean, my family's not going to hop in a car for three hours and come see me, so I need to figure out my shit. And there's no, like, get out of jail free card here. It's stay in line or you're kind of fucked. Yeah. I, sorry, Motola, if you're seeing this, but there were a couple times that we might have snuck into uh, other people's rooms and maybe (laughs) done some not so great stuff. Um, I remember there was, because I I was, believe it or not, I was a chubby goth kid in high school. (laughs) And I had the big, thick shoes, and I had the spiked collar, and I thought I was so in cool. In Rome? This was in Rome. Yep. <laughs> I felt so cool. And back then, the chunky shoes were just coming out, and so I was in heaven. Um, <laughs> but it, it was, uh, yeah, I agree, not 100% supervision all the time, but it also, I felt like it allowed me privileges where I thought, okay, I... You know, I can choose how to use my time. And that was really nice to see when I was younger. And I was like, great, I can choose whether or not I want to study and better my life through this. Or I can go play soccer for three hours. And we right. did do that a couple of times. I will yeah. say I'm a huge soccer fan. So we got to go to see AS Roma, which is my team, um, at the stadium play multiple times. And that was such a great experience. That's crazy. Yeah, but... I mean, Roswell is very cool, too. I've, I've heard the aliens are crazy there. Yeah, they, they've got both types down there. It's kind of weird. Both types. It, yeah. <laughs> the two types of aliens. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, it was, it was all right. That's fuck, That's pretty cool. And, yeah, you get, it sounds like, obviously, you had a lot of freedom to express yourself and to really figure out who you are as you're going through the one of the most awkward times in your fucking life. I have to say, you couldn't pay me to go back to being a high school kid. <laughs> I don't care how much money. Like, that was so rough. I don't know anybody, and maybe they're out there, but none of my friends enjoyed high school. We were all kind of like, okay, we're going to get through this. Right. Like, we'll just wait. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like still, I'm like, okay, we're going to get through this. So, if you don't mind me asking, why the move uh, junior to senior year? Um, Part of it was my dad got sick, and so I wanted to be closer to family. And so... Like, looking back, and I've actually talked to my mom about this, I would have preferred to stay in Italy and graduate with my IB, which is the International Baccalaureate. Um, But it presented, you know, pros and cons to everything. I, my dad was diagnosed with a really aggressive cancer, and so I thought, okay, I want to be close to family. I don't want to deal with this from far away because I don't think that I could. And so that was, that was another, I think, that was the main reason why I decided to come back. And it, it worked out nicely. I went to UNM for undergrad and I got a full scholarship, which was great. Yeah, that's sick. That was, I was really, really happy about that. But I'm glad now they have free tuition. Yeah. So. And so how did your family, you said you went to middle school here in Santa Fe. Mm-hmm. How did your family end up in New Mexico of all places? That's great question. <laughs> um, so my dad, when he came over, uh, they actually, he was in Detroit, Michigan in the 60s. 
of all places. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was... This dude is a walking <laughs> history book. Oh, my God. He's, he's pretty cool. He's done a lot of things. And actually, he was an inventor. So, you know the... Back quote, when that was a thing. The- <laughs> what, do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be an inventor. Oh, yeah, you're right. We do need, like, indoor plumbing. So, go, <laughs> please go figure that out. I'm going to go use the outhouse. Uh, with our five siblings. Please figure it out for the next two generations. Thank you for whoever figured that out. I'm very <laughs> grateful. <laughs> um, but my dad actually helped to invent the Coke can. <laughs> Does he have a patent on it? So he was 19 when... And he, he... was like, we're going to figure need to figure out how to smoke weed at some point in our <laughs> lives. Uh, what if it was aluminum and a cylinder? Perfect. <laughs> So it was actually, he did it with a tuna can and he was, he didn't speak English very well, but, uh, he got a tuna can and they were at this like bar thing and they were playing pool with some of the people that he was starting to work with. And they were talking about the issue with pressure where they have to seal the top and the bottom and then it's carbonated. So you have like pressure issues and I'm not really quite sure what happens there, but he grabbed a figure eight ball. I don't know if it was figure eight or maybe my dad's embellishing. He's like, I grabbed the figure eight ball. And I was like, okay. And he punched a hole in the bottom of the can. You know that indentation on the bottom of the can where it kind of goes up? Yeah. Well, that's to help with the pressure. And so my dad invented that. And then they were living in my family. My dad and his siblings and his mom were living in a car at the time. And then he sold the idea to the company that he was working for at, or a friend's company. And then he bought a car and a house for his family. And that was how they got out of being homeless. And then he was an Olympic skier and he worked with Jimi Hendrix. He was in manufacturing. Yeah, I, I'm like, you got to have my dad on. <laughs> I feel so under accomplished. I run a so- podcast in Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> I make just over $47,000 a year. I have enough debt to put three families out of their homes. And the car does not have AC. I, I think I'm doing great for this timeline. Holy fuck. Good for him. He's pretty cool. Holy shit. Okay, so he's in Detroit in the 60s. Mm-hmm. And then so eventually they make their way to New Mexico. Yes. So my dad had a uh, his great uncle was in Santa Fe. He was one of the flying tigers. He was a pilot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he had a lot of land. And actually, that land he donated for the opera house, the Santa Fe Opera House. So he had a lot of land here. And believe it or not, they didn't know what to do with immigrants. And my dad... They still don't know what to do with immigrants. That's very true. <laughs> that hasn't changed. <laughs> that hasn't fucking changed. They literally put them on a bus and sent them to Martha's Vineyard just to troll the Republic or troll the Democrats. Okay. <laughs> they don't know what the fuck to do so with So nothing immigrants. has changed from the 60s. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. So, uh, your great uncle's here in Santa Fe. Mm-hmm. And they family did- gets, or land gets donated to the opera house. Mm-hmm. And so they didn't know where to put my dad and his family. So they actually moved my dad to the Santa Domingo reservation. So he lived on the reservation for a while and was learning how to speak English. And he told me when he was learning, he grabbed a dictionary and he was trying to learn out of the dictionary. So he would go up to people and be like, salutations to you upon this great day. Because he would learn from the dictionary. Beautiful. And everyone would look at him like, that's not, what are you doing? Like, yeah. you're not supposed to talk like that. Hey, it's in the 60s or 70s, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, man, <laughs> that's not how we talk around here, dude. <laughs> but my, my dad was here when he was younger. He really liked New Mexico when he was here. He you Keep going. I'm just going to check the camera. Oh, yeah, sure. He moved around the world. He was in Japan and all these other places. And so he decided, he was doing a project in California. He met my mom. And they decided to move back to Santa Fe so that they could have a, I guess, a slower or better life. I think they just didn't like the, the pace of California. So uh, that what was what year was that family. again? That when they moved, it was uh, about maybe like twenty years ago. Okay. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Around, so they've been in New Mexico for twenty years. You know Santa Fe Brewing. Yeah. My dad they, helped. Oh, okay. To... I was say, my dad invented the beer that they fucking Wait, sell. Wait, who's there. your dad? Uh, no, no, I thought you were going to say that. Oh. <laughs> no, no. So he did their entire manufacturing and then they did the expansion. So my dad oh, wow. did the expansion there. And then, do you know, there's a new place called Knuckles Brewery. 
No, I've not. Been it's there. in Santa Fe. It's another one that he just opened up. So, it's been. Uh, it was fun. We used to go to the brewery when we were younger, and I would try to put the little bottle caps when they were still doing bottles, and you have to take this lever and push it down on the on the bottle and i would hang from it i didn't even i wasn't i didn't even weigh enough to like <laughs> cause it to go down so that's a fond memory of when i was younger <laughs> holy shit what a, I, wow that's fucking crazy yeah wow so he met my mom moved here and they've been here since that's awesome so you end up moving back and you start uh where did you end your senior year at at santa fe prep santa fe prep mm-hmm. okay apply to UNM, you go down there. What was your intention for school when you started UNM? Uh, same thing that I'm technically doing now. I wanted to be a doctor. Okay. So I went in pre-med. I did a biochem degree and I loved it. I thought it was great. I, I've i always kind of been interested in it. And so when I finally got to be in biochem classes and actually start learning a lot about the medicine it was fascinating. I fell in love. And then I graduated. I took some more time off in between when I graduated with my degree and when I applied to medical school. And I helped teach at the university, the biochem classes. Oh, shit. And what drew you to that specifically? Oh, man. So I feel like medicine is just so broad. Absolutely. There's so many things you can do and like so many studies you can get into. So what, yeah, what drew you to that specifically? That's a great question. You know, I don't, I don't know if I've actually really thought about that. I think it was just always something that it made me excited. I had never felt like a chore to learn about it. I mean, there were times before finals, let alone yeah. honest, that no, I was yeah. crying and I was yeah. nervous. And, <laughs> but I think it was just something that I was drawn to, I think, because it was complex. So it was challenging to get through. And when you finally get it, you get this sense of euphoria almost. You're like, oh, I finally got it. And that's a good feeling. Uh, I think, too, I I was always curious of why, oh, if I drink something and I put sugar in my body, what is actually happening to that sugar? And it was really cool because the teachers I had would make it really relevant. So I remember there was one, I thought it was so cool, like why we get like fat on our body, like what that actually is. And how sugar is turned into that fat and why it weighs differently than protein. And I kind of just like started looking at my body and I was like, wow, like this is glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. <laughs> and, and I got real nerdy about it for a while. <laughs> I'm no shame. I had pathways up on my, like, you know how you have posters? Like your posters are amazing, by the way. Thanks. I had pathway posters. I was such a nerd. <laughs> and when my, someone would talk about that, like, oh, are you hungry? I'm like, I am hungry. I think my glycogen levels are quite elevated right now. And I'm probably doing a little bit of beta oxidation of fatty acids. And Jesus people Christ. would just be like, okay, shut up. Like, that's enough. <laughs> Hey, d- dude, we're at Anodyne at 11.30 at night. <laughs> She's trying to get laid. He just went to puke. Get stop. This is not the turn it off. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I don't get intoxicated very often, but when I do, the nerd side totally comes out. You know Rick and Morty? Yeah. I become Rick. <laughs> 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 it's great. And so I'll just be burping and talking about science and then burping some more. And I don't even know if what I'm saying is correct, but... I'm going to say it anyways. That's fucking hilarious. Talk about, <laughs> just a side note, talk about a fall from grace with the fucking creator and like main voice actor. Did you hear about that? Uh, wait, with uh, Rick and Morty? Yeah. No. So the main dude, um, oh, I know. It's, it's like Dan something, I think. Is it Dan Har- Harmon? Yeah. Is yeah. that it? Harmon. Okay. Yeah. So he, that's why season seven, I've only seen like seasons one through like four, I think one through five. Yeah. But season seven got pushed back for so long because I like, the writer strikes happened and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, on top of that, it came out that Dan Harmon had been uh, sending ex- sexually explicit <gasps> things to 15 and 16 year olds. Oh. And like soliciting them for sex and shit like that. And there was like screenshots and all this stuff of like, I want to say it was text messages and like Snapchat, I think. With like a bunch of fifteen and sixteen year old, and they were like fans of the show, Ooh. which is the scary thing. Yeah, yeah. And then, well, what's fucked up is like, so me and a friend of mine, we were watching the. Uh, they were going through Rick and Morty again, so they could catch up for the new season. And 
we were watching I I was watching like bits and pieces of like I think it was the sixth season, maybe mm-hmm. the end of the fifth. And there's like low key like pedophilic undertones in the like yeah, it's weird. I haven't seen season five, so maybe I'm... Yeah, it's weird. Like if you oh if gosh. you watch at least like because I I'll rewatch bits of like the older stuff because mm-hmm. I just think it's they're funny. Um, but I was like, I haven't really cared enough about the story to like stick with it as a chronological thing. But yeah, I, I, and I just blindly jumped in. Yeah. It was the end of season five. And I was like, damn, like looking at it through the lens of who the creator is in their personal life. I was like, oh my God, this is like, oh no. (laughs) How did nobody fucking catch this? Holy shit. Great show. But there's like little like nuggets where it's like, yeah, I was like, is that a, is that a joke? Cause I'm, cause like, I mean, I'd like to think at least that I, I fully understand you can make a joke about pretty much anything. Mm-hmm. If it's written properly, delivered properly, you can make a joke about pretty much anything. Mm-hmm. But if you add like a little bit too much intention behind it or a little too much like insider baseball behind it, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, and you have a Dan Harmon situation, and it comes out like that. Looking at it through that lens, I guess, it's like, oh, yeah. fuck it. People should have caught that earlier. You know, it's funny that you say that because I, especially working in medicine and I used to work in the ER. Yeah. People have a really dark sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. you have to. It, yeah. And so I yeah. think when you look at the intention behind something, like people from the outside that are not in medicine, they go, oh, how can a, a provider, how can a nurse say something like that? And it's, it's a coping mechanism. Yeah. So I think intention behind something really matters. The intention behind that is not good. Maybe not so good. Yeah. But okay. So serious question. Yes. Where do you stand on Futurama? Futurama. I love that show. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I love it. He well, so Joey. Good. That's his, one of his like favorite like animated shows. I haven't seen it all the way through. But oh, you gotta watch it. But yeah, I've so watched good. like episodes with him and just in like, my own time. Like, oh, I'll watch. Like this is on Netflix right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I enjoy it. Um, I, I think the guy who created it, what's his name, uh, Matt Groening. Mm-hmm. into the simpsons as well i think he's a fucking genius he's an absolute like i was on uh disney plus a couple nights ago and i saw that they put out a new uh, treehouse of terror when for you Halloween. said when you said you were on disney plus i was like wow that's awesome your podcast was on <laughs> disney plus like <laughs> it, disney will never look at me and if it is it's for all the wrong reasons but um no and they did like the newer stuff for the simpsons uh the treehouse of terror for halloween and i was yeah. like oh like this still holds up like they like the newer stuff is good and i heard they're bringing back futurama right i think the they're... new episodes are out i okay. haven't seen it because I I am, I guess, a purist when it comes to that. Like, the new Star Wars, I couldn't watch it. I'm such a Star Wars fan, but the newer ones that came out... The I movies was, or the shows? The the movies. The movies are garbage. <gasps> the new ones or the old ones? The No, the new movies. Like, okay, the good. 7, right. 8, 9. Okay, great. Like, cause cause I was going to get up and walk <laughs> out and use Star Wars. <laughs> no, because again, so him and Springer are like the Star Wars... Like my, I love Star Wars, and I know mm-hmm. enough to hold a conversation for about an hour. And then That's when it good. and then when it gets into the like the extended this and the the, the, the like the books that mm-hmm. and the video games this I'm like I don't know a lot like I who because I know who I am as a person and mm-hmm. I mean you've been in this room long enough to know that I have two obsessions and it's Marvel and DC a little bit of horror films here and there but Marvel and DC that's my shit mm-hmm. I can't apply that obsession to Star Wars because there's so much of it and it's so deep. And, like, I've read, like, a lot of the Vader comics, and mm-hmm. I play, like, the video games uh, here and there. Like, I grew up playing the fucking, uh, it was, like, it was on the original Xbox. I had uh, Republic Commandos, which blew my fucking mind. You ever played that? I haven't. Blew my fucking mind, because it was, like, the closest thing to Call of Duty that Star Wars had at the time. And then uh, the Episode three tie-in game. And that blew my mind, because I was like, oh, I'm Anakin, and I get to use a fucking lightsaber. This is neat. <laughs> this is this is way before I was like Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor. Mm-hmm. Like this is cool shit. But as I've grown up, and obviously you know this because your time is extremely valuable, being a fucking medical student. But you know you, you only have so much time to like scratch that itch of I need to do things that I truly like make me make all mm-hmm. the serotonin and dopamine rush right. Right now, I don't even have time to read comic books. Like I my time, and that's like my thing to mm-hmm. decompress. Like. Right now, all my time goes into this and into stand up. Like, I have to stay up late as shit to play the new Spider Man game. Like, and I lose sleep, and it's fine because I need to know what the fuck happens. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean? So, all that to say, 
I cannot afford, like, my physical health will get affected if I get obsessed with Star Wars because there is so much to do there. Mm -hmm. And that's such a wide playground to play in that I understand why people only love Star Wars. Yeah. I totally fucking get it. I definitely a Star Wars fan, but I did something similar with Lord of the Rings. I had to say, okay, you can't keep... Because I've seen all the extended version. Yeah, right. I... My brother and I, my brother used to live with me, and we would just put that on in the background. And it was one of my favorite, favorite series. And all of my friends can't watch it. They say they fall asleep to it. But I always thought it was really interesting. Midgets walking. It gets old after like <laughs> five hours. I And I appreciate those movies, and I love them as like films. And like the first time I was watching these cinema versions, I was like, oh shit, like this is really cool. Mm -hmm. A little boring here and there, but this is fucking cool. Like, oh my God. But yeah, the rewatch for me is tough. I'll be honest. The rewatch for me, it takes me about two days for one movie. Oh my gosh. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, because I have like, I remember when Best Buy, they put out like their uh, like exclusive version of it. It was before mm -hmm. like 4K started coming out. And it was just like the Blu ray movies of the extended version of like the black covers. Mm -hmm. So I've got those up there somewhere. But yeah, I get it. I, I get it. What do you think of the Hobbit movies? I like Lord of the Rings better than The Hobbit. I did read The Hobbit when I was younger, and I thought it was a really great book. But it was funny. When the second Hobbit came out, I was actually visiting my – she was in boarding school with me. Um, she was from Russia. So I was visiting her in Russia. And so I saw the second Hobbit movie in Russian. And I do not speak very good Russian. I don't speak Russian really at all. I was like, you speak Russian? No. Oh, shit. No. <laughs> um, in fact, actually, when other kids in the school, because I went to school with her in Russia when I was visiting, uh, when other kids would say something to me in Russian and I would not understand them, I would just start singing the theme song of a show called Cheburashka, because I used to watch it when I was a kid. And that was all I did. Like, people would ask me a question. I would just be like, push be good, neoclusion. <laughs> that's it. And I would just keep singing. <laughs> so I, I look back on my high school years. I'm like, man, you were cringy. <laughs> you just went temporarily <laughs> insane and they walked away. Yeah. That's fair. But I did. I saw the second Hobbit movie in Russian at a movie theater. And so I was trying to put the pieces together. And right. I was getting irritated because I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. There's a dragon and <laughs> something's happening. <laughs> so I think that was why I, uh, I was like, well, not for me. Yeah, that's fair. That would do it. Um, anyway, before, before I took this way off track. <laughs> um, so you're in uh, UNM. Biochem is your thing. Mm -hmm. Starting to really get into it. Um Basically, how does pre-med work? And then when do you start focus? Do you focus on a more specific discipline when you get into medical school? Or like, how does that stuff work? Because I don't know if you've noticed, I'm not in medical school. I'll never be in medical <laughs> school. I'm not that guy. So how, like, walk me through like that process. Yeah. So, uh, so with pre-med, you normally say you're pre-med within college. So there are required science classes that you need to just apply to medical schools. So a lot of the chemistries, a lot of the biologies, the biochemistry. And while you're doing that, they, especially at UNM School of Medicine, they really want to see that you're doing things outside of just your academics that are pulling you towards, okay, this is what I want to do and I'm going to get some experiences in it. They need to, at least on paper, they need to see an obsession. For yes. what you're doing. Yes. And it can quickly become an obsession and it is very competitive. I think UNM acceptance is like 9% of applicants. And Damn. most medical schools, I think nationally, and I don't, I don't remember the actual statistic, but it was less than 10%. I think it was around 6% nationally. Well, I know we have one of the best medical schools in the country. For for certain things, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Especially for primary care, we're really good. We're fortunate because... Working with UNM Hospital, there are a lot of different populations, so we get exposure to a lot of very different types of diseases. And, and <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say people. <laughs> people, too, that have the diseases. That, too. I've seen some really cool people that come yeah. in the hospital like, man, you live life different i love it um one of my best friends he lives in uh lives in vegas his name's evan he and we talk every fucking day but he sent me i he works the night shift and he sent me uh 
he works at a hospital and he sent me a Snapchat at like three in the morning of him just, the life is drained from his eyes. Mm -hmm. I just wrestled my third piss covered meth head tonight. Ah, (laughs) yep. I have done that. It is. You come home uh, very tired. (laughs) But um, so with the pre-med program, they like you to have volunteering. They like you to have clinical hours. They want you to have some exposure to what it actually is because as most people know, it, it's a it's a long haul to be in med school, and especially if you want to do a more specialized kind of medicine. So I want to do oncology and hematology. So that means I had to go through four years of undergrad, get my degree, and then then that's the pre med stage. Then you apply to med school. You do four years of medical school, and then you do residency. And then depending on if it requires it, a fellowship. So my residency would be six years or excuse me, three years of residency and then three years fellowship. So I'm going to do six additional years of training outside of medical school and undergrad. And so hematology just deals with blood, right? Yeah. And then oncology is... Is cancer. Cancer, okay. Yeah. So, and... Is uh, that, in, if you mind me asking, is yeah. that doing any part uh, from what your father dealt with? 100%. Yeah? 100%. Do you... What type of cancer did he have? Because so, I'd imagine he, he beat it and he went to some sort of remission... It's kind of. Okay. So it, metastatic cancer, where it basically it spreads to other parts of your body, it's called stage four, it, you can't cure it. So it's beyond a cure rate. So a lot of okay. times if we catch cancers early, you can, okay, I can radiate it or I can just remove the whole thing through surgery or I can give you chemo and we kind of watch it over time. Once it goes to other parts of the body and the cancer cells infiltrate other parts, it's no longer curable okay that doesn't necessarily mean that okay you're you're gonna die right away or something like the cancer can be really slow growing right and it'll grow based on other things so my dad had a really aggressive prostate cancer Mm. and it spread to a lot of his bones pretty quickly oh man and so uh it he went through chemo he it was really rough on everybody and he's still having to take this is four years since that. Uh, he's still having to take medication daily to decrease his testosterone levels so that the to cancer doesn't... decrease. Decrease it, yes, because the prostate cancer will grow off of testosterone. Oh, my God. And my dad, he was, he was also a, a pro wrestler, <laughs> so... <laughs> so, okay, okay, just, okay, so this fucking guy survived concentration camps during a revolution. Mm -hmm. He invented a pretty crucial part of the Coke can and may or may not have been an understudy for Ric Flair. (laughs) (laughs) What the fuck are we talking about? Who is this guy? He's, he's done a lot. Uh, my, I will say I'm, I love my dad. And like, sometimes some of his stories when I was younger, I'm like, dad, you're lying. That's not true. And he would show me these photos and I was like, how, did you not sleep? He's like Forrest Gump. Like <laughs> he's getting CG'd in every major <laughs> world event. <laughs> I would love if somebody would make a movie about my dad. I think that that would be great because even so, I noticed you have Fender guitars. Yeah. My dad did the manufacturing for Jimi Hendrix and Fender guitars. So it's funny because Damn. I I was younger. I think I was oh gosh I was seven. And I saw this case under my bed and I thought, oh, this is cool. So I opened it. It was a signed Hendrix guitar. And my dad, I thought it was so cool. So I'm plucking on these strings, just like pulling them up. And my dad came in and almost had a heart attack. He's like, put that away. (laughs) Yeah. That's the appropriate response. Yeah. That is the appropriate human response (laughs) to that specific situation. Holy shit. But to go back, because my dad was always pretty physically fit and then he was a the Olympic skier. And so he did a lot. And I think it was really rough for him to start losing the testosterone. He lost a lot of muscle mass. And I think that's what really is, is rough. And I mean, anybody else going through any type of cancer diagnosis, it's extremely rough on them. And not to ask an extremely basic question, but generally you hear that a lot where it's chemo's hard, chemo's rough. And then you see the individuals that go through and they, they lose their hair and they get very uh, weak. What, what is the, purpose behind chemotherapy what is it trying to do to the cancer cells and at what what's the i know it's i'd imagine it's very different for every patient Mm -hmm. but at what point is it hey the chemo's not working 
Yeah, so um, a lot of times when you start somebody on chemo, the, the whole goal is to really just eradicate the cancer. So there are different markers on cancer cells. And so you will do analysis of what type of cancer cells they have. And there's different markers. And then you'll say, okay, I'm going to give you something that's going to tag the marker and then it's going to basically destroy it. So it is different depending on what the cancer is and the also the progression of the cancer, if it's early stage or late stage. But um, when it comes to chemo, a lot of times the reason it's so rough is because it just destroys your immune system. It just, I mean, it destroys the natural, it's a poison. Through what process? Um, so... It depends on, again, like what type of targets. So with chemo, you're eradicating the the bad cells, but it also can kill the good cells too. And so your body too, and it there's different types, but um, your body will, basically the same thing as being poisoned. Um, your body will shut down certain areas. Your body will have mechanisms to try to compensate um, for lack of whatever it is that you're targeting. So it's, yeah, chemo's rough. Now, some chemos are worse than others. Like there was a patient uh, that I had the chance to work with and to see. He had, they're called brain mets, and that's a term for, uh, he has some type of metastatic cancer that moved to his brain. And so that's pretty serious that you have cancer cells in your brain. So he had to go through a methotrexate treatment and so you can use methotrexate to, uh, actually it's used for osteoporosis at really, really low doses. So I think like a regular dose, I think I might be wrong about this, but it's really low. It's like 0.5 or something milligrams. This guy was given 3,500. So basically, and so what you have to do is you have of to this do this. Of this medicine. Of this medicine. Jesus. And so what you have to do is you give him this medicine and you do it in a hospital setting. And basically when it gets to a point where they're starting to fail because it's a, it is literally a poisonous amount, you give them an antidote. And then you watch them and then you give them another antidote. And so these... Holy fuck. And I have to say that's one thing I'm really grateful for in terms of the length of time because everyone's like, oh my gosh, you're going to be in school forever. You're going to be learning forever because you'll be a resident and a fellow for six years. You should be. I, I agree. I'm grateful for the time because... <laughs> you fucking should be. I can literally kill people. And I think the part that's scary too, and I remember with this patient, and I was with a really fantastic provider who one thing that I really like that he told me, he goes, it's important to hold space for somebody to be able to express what they're feeling or just to even take in the information. But he told this guy, he said, I'm going to give you this methotrexate treatment because if I don't, you'll die. But if I give this to you, it might kill you. Like that's really that's really rough. And so you really have to know what you're doing when you're giving yeah. these meds. But to answer your question of what happens if it doesn't work. So a lot of times you start somebody on chemo and you look at the progression of their disease. Is the cancer getting smaller? Is it staying the same or is it growing? So depending on to what the cancer is, that will change the likelihood of if it's going to progress or not or the percentage chance that someone will do okay once they get the chemo sometimes you need more than that uh, than just chemo then there's you know there's radiation and then these can have really long-term effects so did you know your red blood cells all the blood in your body gets recycled every 90 days Yes, actually. I didn't know Crazy. that. Crazy. Yeah. Like that blows my mind. And so did you know that your broken red blood cells is what makes your pee yellow and your poop brown? I did not. Yeah. Thanks for that. There no, you I go. Didn't <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Did not know that. Yeah, those are, it's called bilirubin. It's called, huh? Bilirubin. And it's basically the, the Yeah, if I had another group. whiskey, I thought you'd say belly rubbing. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's, it's I like super fascinating, but... Your pelvis in the, the bone marrow makes, and especially when you're an adult, because before you're a lot of like babies, you can make red blood cells in other bones. But as you age, the main factory of red blood cells is in your pelvis. Hmm. And so if you radiate somebody's pelvis, which they've done before, you're basically giving them anemia 
which oh, is shit. a decrease in red blood cells. Right. Because you've affected the factory in which they can produce these red blood cells. So they can have really long-term effects depending on what you're going to go for. But yeah, no, I love, as, as morbid as it is, I think oncology is the most hopeful profession because some of the new medications that they're coming out with and um, like the immunotherapies, I, I just, I'm blown away by what, people can come up with to yeah well and i'm glad i'm glad you said that because i mean i've talked about it a lot on and off of this but now more than ever ever the public is getting exposed to the severe corruption it's let's just say government institutions and especially big pharma like we're being exposed to how corrupt a lot of this shit is yeah and I, i the logical like negative track for that is well big pharma is shitty that means it needs to get overthrown, and then that means that capitalism is shitty, and here's why it's bad. It's like, okay, no, no system is perfect, yeah. and I'm not a finance guy. I'm not a money guy. I'm not a numbers guy, but obviously, we're in some negative version of late-stage capitalism. Okay, great, but that's still a better option than anything else that's available. That's one of the main reasons, is the system we have mixed with the medical foundation we have, it garners more often than not it garners new and better innovation to treat things like cancer. Now, again, I can't say that without putting on a tinfoil hat. And it's like, well, yeah. you know, if they wanted to cure it, they would have already. It's like, well, could they have, though? Because then I hear stories like that, and it's like, fuck, man, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm Because there is the argument for like, well, they, why would you ever want to cure a patient that has to keep buying the product? Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, but... Yes, I, I, I can definitely see that point of view. It's just the type of guy I am. Yeah, I got it. But then on the other hand, it's like, I think there's more than enough fucking cancer patients right now. I think there's more than, especially everything that we're finding out about how microplastics and dyes and seed oils and all these things in our day-to-day, the American diet that yeah. cause cancer, there is no shortage. Yeah. I promise you there is no shortage. And then with COVID happening that it, and it exposing how overwhelmed the medical system even in America can get, I think it would almost be in the big pharma's best interest to start curing these things. Mm-hmm. To If you really want to get morbid about it, cure the old patients now so they can bring new ones in and keep the money rolling. If they really, because this shit's about to fucking collapse. Yeah. If COVID was anything, right? Yeah. So, but to tie this all back around, that is, I'm glad you said that. Because that is a perfect example of what a decent medical foundation mixed with capitalism garners yeah. right there. And it's a good thing that you're spending the better part of a decade in school. Yeah. Because what the fuck? You can't exactly take a master class on that. Yeah. <laughs> I. There's not Google how-to videos on how to cure cancer. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm very happy to hear you got to do fucking 10 yeah. years of this shit. No, I'm, I'm happy I have the time. And I think, too, I... I agree with you on the pharma aspect. And there are parts of the medical system that, yeah, I really want to go into the medical field, but I also realize it's it's kind of a messed up system and there are things that we need to work on. But I, I think that it depends to where you're coming from because I grew up in a household, you got a headache, drink a water, you're not going to take medicine. We don't like medicines in our house. I grew up in more of like, okay, herbs and teas and try working out. And to some extent, <laughs> which I really need to do. <laughs> Try working out. Try going for a walk yeah. or lifting weights. Um, <laughs> and I think to some extent, yes, like it's heartbreaking to see patients that come in that are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes because their lifestyle is not yeah. healthy. And then they have to be taking all of these other medications and that causes other issues. And we like... And so I think that just throwing a drug at certain things is not fixing the problem. It's just masking the symptoms. Yeah. But I, I also think that if you're coming from a place where you've never really had a really difficult diagnosis and not saying that diabetes is not a difficult diagnosis, it is, but you go up to a cancer patient that is yeah. in remission who went through chemo and it was really rough, but now their cancer has gone and you tell them, I hate medicine and I hate pharma. Well, pharma was the one that that made it so they could keep living. And so there is a yeah. there's pros and cons to everything, but I think it it really depends on where you're coming from. Is are you coming from a place where the medication saved you? Yeah, you're going to probably like the medication a little bit more than those who see it from an outside point of view. 
Right. So no, you're you're spot fucking on. Um, so the last question I want to ask about your is I'm really interested in the medicine your father's taking now is lowering the testosterone mm-hmm. because fuck this was back in 2021 I think mm-hmm. 20, no it was 22 so it was last it was two Februarys ago. I finally decided to, uh, cause I came back from being overseas and I was like, okay, I'm going to fucking get my health together a little bit better. And then I'm going to, I've always wanted, because I've always been a fit guy, but I've wanted to figure out like, what is my blood level? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. And uh, I did my blood work and the doctor was like, hey, man, uh, your test levels are at 215 nanograms per deciliter. And I was like, cool Tra- translate that to english dude what the <laughs> fuck does that mean he goes and and he goes yeah you should be in like 900 and i was like oh <laughs> he goes i think i think it was a fluke uh make we're gonna redo in a month make mm-hmm. sure that you get decent sleep don't eat get here by seven in the morning so your testosterone's high all that type of stuff. i was like okay sounds good a month later get my blood work done again it's at 185 and they're like Okay, come back in two weeks. Mm-hmm. 168. And they're like, are you dying? Like, what the fuck is going? What's wrong with you? And I'm like, that, you tell me. <laughs> like, what the fuck? And they were like, okay. And, and it got so bad that at the hospital that I was at, they moved me from like working with like a uh, endocrinology provider that mm-hmm. like I, the person working my case was the head of endocrinology. Wow. Because they didn't know what the fuck was going on. And they're like, at least... 15, 20 times I got screened. They were like, hey, wow. have you abused steroids? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me check. No. <laughs> yeah, no. The, the, thanks for the compliment, but no. And then they're like, okay, so that, uh, you abuse opiates? And I was like, no. And they're like, okay, do you like this, 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 and this? And I'm like, I no, dude. I don't know what the fuck's going on. So then I had to get on TRT. And yeah, yeah and I'm, I'm looking to get back on now because the provider that I went to, it worked. Like now my test levels are at like one, no, no, they're at 450 something. Mm-hmm. But I'd like, because at one point, uh, due, due to some uh, other avenues that I took, let's put it that way, uh, I was, because I don't want to have like super therapeutic levels. Mm-hmm. You know, I have no, no desire to do that. I just want to feel like a normal human being. And for about six, seven months, I got my levels up to like 850, I think. 850, 880 around mm-hmm. then. I felt fucking great. I felt fucking amazing. I was sleeping better. I was just feeling better. Obviously, a lot more energy. Mm-hmm. My severe depression and anxiety gone. Wow. And I was like, this is, you know what? Needle in the butt ain't that bad. This is <laughs> fucking awesome. But went back to the provider I was going to, and uh, they redid my stuff after I, because I stopped for like three months, went back to them, did my blood work. And so the TRT worked. It got me to about 450 now, but I'd like to be where I was. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So obviously at nowhere near the level your what your father was going through, but low test is a fucking issue. Yeah. It is a issue. And so what you kind of touched on a little bit earlier, but what is that specific cancer doing that's forcing him to lower testosterone? Yeah, that's a good question. So the prostate cancer feeds off of testosterone. So it will get bigger and grow the more testosterone that is there. Jesus. So what this medication does is it stops the testosterone basically in your body and brings it down to near nothing. And that then makes it so the cancer can't grow. And you measure uh, prostate cancer based on something called a PSA. So it's a PSA level. And it's been really low for a long time because the cancer doesn't have anything to grow off of. And so that's why, that's the thinking behind it is we're going to make it so there's nothing for your cancer to feed on so that it can't keep growing, especially because it's already spread to other places of your body. So is there any chance that in parts of the body it goes away completely, there's nothing to feed off of, or it just exists? It just exists. So there's always, so if you're, I'm trying to like describe the way it's working in my brain. So like if you're at zero Mm -hmm. and it's growing, growing, it's like at 50 you're never going to be able to drop down to 40, but you'll stay at 50. Exactly. Okay. Jesus. And so right now it's fine. Um, I, it's hard because when you decrease those levels, like really bad hot flashes, you can get mood swings. 
it's not an easy thing, especially for my dad, who's always been able to just kind of bounce back. Yeah. He's always been really healthy. And I think that was another thing I learned when I was in clinic in Santa Fe. I had an oncology clinic was, okay, if you're going to treat somebody for a certain type of cancer, what is their life going to look like after? And what is their life going to look like during? And weighing yeah. those pros and cons. That's a hard yeah, and uh, I couldn't imagine making that decision for someone, let alone being a provider. Fuck that. Yeah. Well, I think that's what I like about oncology in terms of we're not making these decisions, but we're holding the space for patients to be able to make those decisions. So fair enough. There yeah. was I remember there was a, a older woman that came in. She had pretty uh, advanced cancer, and they didn't catch it until later. But she was in her mid eighties. She had other pre-existing health conditions. She was living a good life. And we said, great, we can give you this chemo, but you're going to be miserable for years. And we yeah. don't even know if we can actually get rid of it. So she made the decision. She said, I don't want to do chemo. I'm older. I love my life right now. I'm going to ride it out. And that was her decision. And so we supported that. Yeah. I mean, it's very, I also think there is a big difference between like there were people coming in that were in their early 30s. That's, yeah. Versus in your 80s. And and to me, I'm going to help, uh, like, as a provider, um, when I get to that point, I'm going to help them with whatever they decide. But I am going to think about it a little differently in terms of their treatment plan. Are they older? And can they even handle what we're going to give them? Because when you're in your 80s and you're throwing up every day, that's, you're going to handle that differently than if you're in your 30s and There's throwing up There's a lot of trauma on the body. It's yeah. a lot of trauma. So, but I'm at least glad that you got some results from taking yeah testosterone that i think that's great and you probably i mean i can imagine you felt so much better so yeah yeah i felt fucking amazing and i've and it's funny now because like because originally um when i was like looking more into my health and shit I, i'd gone to a shrink originally and i was like hey mm -hmm. i'm fucking i i've like all my friends are better after high school and i am the same if not worse what the fuck is going on and of course cause it, again the negatives had a big farmer just threw pills at me yeah and so i took them and i felt good like mm -hmm. i felt okay for like four months five months and then i didn't get back to where i was but i started dipping down and leveling out and i was like okay if i tell them what's going on they are going to just up my dosage because mm -hmm. i was terrified of taking medications and psychotics in the first place yeah. I, will, I know a lot of people that have taken them and just the shit thankfully my dosage was very low and it didn't really fuck with me too much. Then I get a whole lot of side effects. But I was like, I don't want... I see where this road goes down, and I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I'm getting off. Fuck it. And I got off. So, but yeah, then getting and figuring out what the actual issue was. It was a hormonal issue. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay. Here we go. And yeah, I felt fucking amazing. Well, that's something that bothers me about the medical system is we... There's not a lot of time to actually connect with your patients. And then... It's a good thing that you are so self-aware of how you were feeling and you were able to express it because that's another thing that I've noticed with patients is that we don't promote being self-aware of, okay, this is the issue or this is what's maybe, uh, this is what I'm doing in my life or this is what I'm feeling. And I think that having a combination of both promoting self-awareness for how you're actually living your life and what you're doing for your health combined with giving providers enough time to actually get through the necessary information to treat a patient because it like I remember I went to a, a physician recently and they saw that I was a med student they said you're just stressed and I oh I I almost went off on them I was so angry because I was like no I'm telling you that I have an issue and it's not just anxiety and it's not just stress. <laughs> and it, like maybe if you sit down and talk to me and like get to know right. me a little bit more, maybe right. then you can see that. And it turned out I had a chronic immune disorder. Oh, fuck. And so it was yeah. like. No, you're, you're stressed out. You're reading the books too much. Which I will say the stress does bring it on. Well, they thought it was solely stress. Right. It's going to make it worse. All that I'd imagine the high cortisol is going to fuck with that a lot. But I mean, you know. Yeah. And part of that too was the, maybe the provider that I had wasn't having their best day. And yeah. so I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt of they just didn't look over things or 
Also, too, how do you expect to get to know somebody within 10 minutes right. and diagnose them? Like, they don't know if I am just a stress case because of school, which I kind of am. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> there are moments when I'm like, ah, stressed yeah. out and just cry in the library. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think having more time with patients to actually get to know them and having a relationship with them over time is something I really want. And that's why oncology is really important. And then the hematology aspect all of my I'm Eastern European, so all my ancestors are vampires. So that's why I'm like paying tribute to my ancestors. I'm gonna go into hematology. Jesus Christ, <laughs> that's fucking funny. Did you uh, did you watch? Uh, it came out I think this past summer. Uh, Renfield with Nicolas Cage. No, but I want to. It's fucking amazing. Is it good? Okay, like, I'm gonna watch it. It's like, I don't know if you've seen like the old school like Dracula, I like have. the black and oh, white. Yeah. The, I don't think it's a major spoiler because they throw in all the marketing, but like in the first 10 minutes, they pretty much recreate the major scenes with Bella Lugosi, but it's Nick Cage. Oh, cool. And it's like, yeah, I'd love to see it. It's perfect. It's insane the way they did it. Um, fucking, yeah, it's a great fucking movie. I saw it was on streaming a couple nights ago. I'm going to save that for later because I saw it in the theaters, thank God. And it was so <laughs> good. Oh, my so you're studying these two, or you're going to these two practices. Mm -hmm. um, I just I want to ask a couple of questions, I guess, before we get into the topic of addiction and what it does to the brain. Yeah. What led you down to studying stuff like that or anything surrounding that? Yeah. And what was that experience like? So I think, and also to answer a previous question that I just realized I didn't answer, was you had asked in medical school if it's you get to kind of pick what you want to go into. Yeah. And so every single provider goes through the same classes in med school. So we all have how it works is the first two years of med school, we have our, our academic phase. So this is where you are thrown into all of the different systems of the body. And by the end of those two years, you take your, it's called USMLE, and it's a step exam. So this is a national board exam. It's a licensing exam that you have to take in order to go on to the clinical aspect of medical school, which is your last two years. So it's a it's a pretty big, it's like an eight-hour exam. And uh, it's, it's pretty heavy detail on all of these different systems. So you have a, we always use the first aid book and it's like this thick. And I remember asking a friend, I said, okay, what should I do for step? And I showed her the book. She goes, memorize it. I said, memorize what? She goes, the book memorize the book and so i was like okay you see i was the kid during the standardized exams or i would rush through my exams so i get a 15 minute nap after each test <laughs> that was me what the, an eight hour exam yep we to Fuck. get into med school you have to take something called the mcat and yeah, i've heard of that that's right. about seven and a half hours Fuck you that's <laughs> 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 no just no like i get it and i get I'm, again i'm glad it's there mm -hmm. but there's like and everyone has it everyone's personality their brain has it whether you mm -hmm. just tell them things and they immediately reject it that's one of them i i yeah no you just know, no it it was i'm not gonna lie it was hell going through it but i'm kind of glad because it gave me a taste of what we have to do for the first two years of med school i mean right. we have exams every single week and then we have these huge final exams and the amount of material, and I knew everyone was like, oh, it's a lot of material. I got through, so there was a biochem class, and I thought, okay, this is my jam. Every single thing that we covered in under in undergrad, in that like year and a half of biochem, we covered in a week and a half in med school. Every single thing we covered. And I thought, oh my gosh, I here I thought my degree was going to prepare me and make it a lot easier it was for a week and a half in med school but with medical school uh so you, you go through those first two years and then you do your rotation so this is where you get to go to different specialties and you basically are there trying to participate and shadowing a lot of doctors and this is really great because it gives you an idea of what each specialty actually looks like so that's third year. And then fourth year, you're continuing doing that, but then you also start applying for residency. Um, so everybody kind of does the same thing. Mainly in third and fourth year, you start really more third year. You start pinpointing what it is that you want. A lot of the reason why I decided to go into oncology and hematology, or at least why I, I'm pursuing that right now, is partly because of my dad, because I saw how hard it was 
for family to go through it. And I wanted to be a provider that could help with that. And so that was, I had, we had a really good doctor. Yeah, that's sick. And so that was a really great experience having a good doctor. And I actually did a pie rotation with him, which is something we do in our second year of medical school. So I was with him for six weeks and I got to shadow and see a little bit more of what it was like. And one thing I like about cancer in terms of the science of it, one, it's super hopeful because new medications are coming out, but also it's everywhere on the body. So you have to be able to understand all of the systems of the body. And this is why you do internal medicine as a residency and then specialize because you have to have a good idea of how the body works as a whole, which I think is super fascinating. Yeah, I feel like a very like compendious knowledge of exactly. what's going on. Yeah. And I think also too, part of it was it was it was fun because it was super creative. Okay, you have a patient coming in and a lot of people think, okay, you got cancer, I'm gonna give you chemo and then you're done. And some patients are like that because they're more straightforward. But if the chemo you're going to give a patient is processed by their kidneys and the patient that comes in has severe kidney failure, what are you going to do? And so it's a very creative process in trying to figure out how am I going to solve the puzzle of their cancer? If I ever get cancer and my diagnosis and solution went about as quick as you just described it, I'm going to a different hospital. <laughs> I hope you never get cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's an interesting way of looking at it. You're putting like a weird jigsaw puzzle back together. Yeah, and I, I think that another thing I find really fascinating about it is you both have to be, there's a lot of emotional ties to it, which is something that I really like. I want to work with patients and have those interactions. So having to both be, Okay, you have to be strong for the patient and you have to make sure that you're somebody they can lean on while also being empathetic and understanding that this is really rough while also looking at it from the like the actual science point of view of, okay, how much do I give them hope in this or how much do I just... And yeah. I think the balance of that is is a privilege and it's extremely rewarding and having... You know, there's bad news, but there's a lot of good news. If you're a good provider, um, I saw a lot more good news than I did bad when I was in clinic. And so that was really nice to see. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Huh. Well, I'd imagine, too, that there's there's an element of detachment as well, though, to protect yourself. 100%. There has to be. Yeah. Um, and that's not, I don't think that's a very cold or ugly thing to say, but I mean, you can't just keep pouring your proverbial cup into everyone else's mug. And I, I completely agree. I saw this, uh, I guess it's not a meme, but it was a short video. And it was actually from the show Scrubs from a long yeah, time ago. Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah, and fuck yeah. There was a, a moment where he was like, okay, you want to know why we make jokes, why we joke about these things? And he said, look at that provider. He's going in there telling the family that there was a complication and the patient died. Do you think anybody else in that room is going to go to work today? Do you think any of them are going to do anything else besides mourn the loss of their family member? No, but what does he have to do? In the next 10 minutes, he has to go and give either good or bad news or just get back to work. And so in the the little shot, they talked about, we don't do it because it's fun. We do it because it's necessary. And that right. was him making jokes. And so, yeah, I think I'm still learning how to detach. There were some rougher cases that I'm like, okay, I'm... I can be empathetic while also looking at it through a, uh, like, you can think about like looking at through plexiglass, you're protected, but you can see everything that's happening. And another thing too, that I really liked again about this clinic I was at was they said, you're going to have times where it is going to affect you and you can cry about it and you can feel what it feels like. And then you get through that, you process that and you get back to work. There's going to be some people that just really stick with you and they'll probably stick with you for the rest of your life. But you can process and move forward. And so right. that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So going through those two studies, mm -hmm. when do you get to lack of a better term, like addiction research studies on shit like that? What path led you to that? I'm assuming that's where you met Natalie. I did meet and Natalie. Shout there, out to yes. Natalie for uh, messaging <laughs> Love me you, and, girl. <laughs> and suggesting you. Um, like I said, I really enjoyed the, 
the 20 to 25 minutes that I listened to the podcast you guys did. So, Thanks. yeah. Um, so what led you to that? Because if I was listening to that and I heard things properly, you had to interview her, right? I did interview ah. her. It was great. <laughs> like over Zoom and there was like a panel mm-hmm. of you guys. That's hilarious. I Yes, I did interview her. So <laughs> I'm not laughing at her. I just, I'm laughing at the situation. I just think that's hilarious. No, it was, it was great. And I remember the whole time she's just sitting and was like this, like very pro- super professional right. i got the best vibe from her because we were interviewing other people as well and what was something... it for it was for so we were curriculum or not curriculum what am i saying <laughs> other job we were research coordinators okay so and it was going into like addiction stuff exactly right. so okay. this was for clinical trials so we were based in the er and we had a clinical trial going on if you don't mind i'm gonna grab my glass really quick oh yeah of course should I stop? No, no, go ahead. No, okay. go ahead. Um, so we were in we were in the ER, based in the ER, and we had a task of basically recruiting. Did you patients. want a little splash? Oh no, I'm good. Okay. I got my yeah, you're caffeine. Good. Okay. But thank you. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um but this one is really good. Thank I, you. I do like black label. So. I appreciate well I done. appreciate the taste. Thank you. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, care, uh, your coordinators, research coordinators. Exactly. So we were hired to basically, uh, take this clinical research study, get patients and put them through the process of being in the study. So Interesting. I had done clinical research prior to being at Presbyterian for where I met Natalie. And it was very different. What I did prior to that was multiple trials, uh, at the same time. So whenever a drug is getting approved, or even if the drug itself is approved, but you want to go through a different way of administering it, it has to go through a clinical trial. So we, sorry, I'm just going to. No, you're good. Okay. So um, we were hired. What year year was this? This was, oh my gosh, what what year was this? It was during COVID. Okay. I just asked. I think 2020. Because I mean, removing politics from it, but yeah. one of my favorite things for, that came out of the Trump administration was he approved the, uh, they call it like the right to try bill. Yeah. Where basically it was like if you had an experimental medication that was still going through trials, wasn't FDA approved, mm-hmm. couldn't actually be uh, prescribed or given by doctors, if it's available and it's gone through enough things like mm-hmm. to pass a certain threshold, um, Patients could elect to use it. Yeah, seems pretty good to me. There, I think there are there are pros and cons. Yeah, but I think there were oh, a for lot. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. but when you're but when you're acknowledging the fact that it's like, yeah, this is not approved yet. This could work. This could not work. Yeah. This is the data we have. What do you think? Yeah, making the constitution, especially if you are uh, in one of those unfortunate situations where, say, you are a 30, 40 year old that has a severe cancer, you could die. Yeah, there's not really a lot of available situations yet, except for this. This could be witchcraft for all we know. Yeah. But it could save your life. Yeah. And if death is the common denominator anyway, why wouldn't you try? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, anyway. No, no. I think yeah. I think <laughs> I I agree with you. <laughs> um. So with this trial, what was good about it was so in a lot of clinical trials you can have like a placebo or just like a sugar yeah. versus the actual medication. So the drug we were working with is called buprenorphine. It was already approved to give via do you know what suboxone is i've heard the i've heard it but i don't know what it is yeah so suboxone is the mixture of buprenorphine and naloxone or narcan as we say it so okay this is given for people when they have an opiate use disorder so this would be somebody who is using it can even be prescribed like oxycodone they can get hooked on oxycodone because it is an addictive substance and yeah. then i yeah. mean prescribed well, well that well that's what was crazy to me is that the opiate let's say opiate crisis epidemic yeah whatever it is um it's getting so bad now that i was at the hospital i was at the pharmacy rather getting uh, a medication and someone got prov- uh got prescribed oxycodone and mm-hmm. the person like talking into the window with the pharmacist was like hey uh yeah so you did get prescribed this but because of what you're prescribed we're also uh, prescribing you with narcan and the person didn't know what narcan was yeah and so this poor pharmacist had to explain what Narcan is and why they might need to use it in the near yeah. future. And they're like, yeah, if you OD on this, uh, you use this. This is this. Someone has to use this on you. A hundred percent. So 
opiates are a respiratory depressor. And so they make it so you, you don't breathe, basically. And so when somebody takes too much, they can sadly overdose and pass away. And so the Narcan reverses that or the naloxone reverses that same thing. So when somebody has, say they're, they're using oxycodone and this could be prescribed because they had a really bad surgery. When you stop using the oxycodone, you're going to go through withdrawal symptoms. And a lot of those, um, in med school, it's, we, we look at them as we call them the wet symptoms of runny nose, diarrhea, sweating, things like that. And depending on how dependent you are on that substance will depend will determine how bad your withdrawals are a lot of the time and what's triggering that yeah so it's it's basically your body gets used to or has a tolerance for having a regular signal from the opiate you then take the opiate away and your body's like dude what the heck and so it comes up with these other symptoms which are your withdrawal symptoms and so this medication that we were testing is given a lot of times in Suboxone, and there's other ways of giving it, but uh, it is a, it's called a partial opiate ag- agonist. So what it does is it only binds a little bit to what you're normally used to so that the withdrawal symptoms are not as bad. Your body still has somewhat of a signal. It's like, okay, I'm not freaking out. I have a little bit there. And this is given to patients that need help getting over those physical symptoms of dependency. How is that different from, uh, what the fuck is it called? Uh, methadone. Great question. So they're very, they're used in a very similar fashion. They're both used for opiate use disorder withdrawals. So people going through really bad withdrawals. Methadone is a full agonist. So it creates a a much, I don't want to say stronger, but it is stronger, like a, a much, uh, higher effect on the receptor. So it binds fully versus binding partially. And for some people, methadone works beautifully for them. Methadone, when you're first start on it, though, can be a little rough because you have to go to a methadone clinic to be dosed and you have to do this daily because methadone in itself is it's still an opiate. I was going to say, isn't methadone itself addictive? A hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. So the, the idea with methadone or buprenorphine is that you give people these medications to ultimately wean them off of it. Now, some people have been on methadone for 30 years and that's how they function. And so they want to continue being on methadone. And I think for each person, you have to figure out how, what would work best for you and what you need to ultimately stop using heroin, fentanyl, unsafe opiates. And so at least I've heard it a lot where it's if you people that use methadone habitually because they have to, they kind of get zombied out. Yeah. What's causing that? That's a great question. I am not quite sure. Um, Part of it too is just like the euphoric effects of being on opiates and some of the the things that the receptors, the signals cause can cause the zombie-like effects. I mean, it is, it's a powerful medication that affects your entire body. Okay. And so, and there's different receptors depending on what you are, um, binding to but a lot of patients that i know with the buprenorphine which is the one we studied don't feel quite as zombied if you call it that um because it's just not as strong of a signal and the idea behind these is that if you help somebody with the physical symptoms of withdrawal which are horrific to go through you can then focus more on the mental aspects of your withdrawals or why it is that you were using opiates in the first place and figure that out because the physical aspects have have been somewhat tamed for you that makes sense yeah and then we give the with suboxone we give the (sighs) naloxone with it so that if you're taking say i it's an oral medication say i give you suboxone um, because you need it because you're having these withdrawals the naloxone caps your receptors so that Basically, you can't, if I injected you with heroin after that, it wouldn't have any effect. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And also, it's the main reason, though, um, from what I've told from providers, is that if you give the naloxone with it, you can't, like, take the suboxone, crush it up, and inject it. You'll get really sick if you do that. And inject it where you just have straight buprenorphine, which is uh, 
you know, going to activate the opiate receptors. So generally speaking, what is it about opiates that make them so fast acting and then make them so addictive? And I ask because obviously fentanyl is a huge uh, crisis in this country right now. Yeah. Um, it's like fentanyl is like the opiate of Voldemort. Like you, like it's the, he should not be named like yeah. how bad it is. Yeah. Um, I had a surgery end of May and I got out of surgery. I was waking up and yeah. I was in a fuck ton of pain. And they were like, hey, like, how are you feeling? Are you in pain? And I still, I still got the breathing tube down my throat. And I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm still fucking in pain. Yeah. So, and they're like, okay, we're going to hit you with, a, we're going to give you some fentanyl. Mm-hmm. And my brain was like, huh? <laughs> like, yeah. what the fuck? But then they hit me with it and it was instant. It was obviously to my IV. It was instant. Yeah. I felt zero pain. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't even process like, Oh no, it's fentanyl before the fentanyl hit. And I was like, oh, well, this is quite nice. Yeah. I feel no pain. This is amazing. And even like on my way, uh, on my way to the uh, operating room, they were wheeling me in, they hit me with some Valium to, for, uh, for, to calm my anxiety. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is, like it literally, <laughs> I remember laying in bed and they're wheeling me in. And I'm like, I'm starting to freak out a little bit. And I'm like praying to God in my head, right? I'm like, yeah. oh, please. If I don't want to die, this is not how I want to die. I still, I still, I still got cool shit I want to do. Like, what the fuck? And then as I'm like praying, they hit me with the Valium. I'm like, Life's nah. good. <laughs> nah, nah. Nah, guy, you got this. These doctors got this. We're ch- get, yeah, they're really, We're cool. So it's like, oh my God, this shit hits fast. Yeah. So, so and I would imagine the difference between like the fentanyl you're going to find on the street and the fentanyl you're getting given in obviously like getting purity of it out of the way the dosage in a hospital setting is so much lower than you know on the street i would imagine so it's funny that you say that so i i have a tumultuous relationship with fentanyl just as as you should as i should (laughs) and so i think that i've seen it we're taking a bit of a break right now (laughs) it's been very toxic to me um it's not treating me right yeah (laughs) Keeps lying to me. <laughs> there you go. Uh, fentanyl can just be like a, a, a euphemism for an X. There you go. I <laughs> like it. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I can use big words, big silver words too, but I can also fuck up my sentences. Yeah. Anyway, continue. Um, so I think with fentanyl, as I've seen it used for a lot of good. So like actually a lot of cancer patients, they're in a lot of pain when yeah. they're going through certain treatments. They have fentanyl patches. And yeah, so, mm-hmm. I had I had a couple of people in my uh, when I was working in caregiving that had f- fentanyl patches. Yeah, yeah. So right. that's the thing is it can do really good in certain settings. So and isn't sorry to cut you off, but no, isn't go the ahead. It, isn't obviously the method of getting it transdermal? Wouldn't that is a slower process than just IV? Yeah. So that's kind of a part of it, right? Is that you're not getting hit with it all at once. It's a slow um, like metabolism over time. Yeah, and you can actually give like <coughs> slow acting things like uh, or extended release is what we call it. You can even inject something into the muscle and have it be extended release where it just releases slowly over time. Um, but with the fentanyl, it actually just depends on the patient. I've seen some pretty high doses of fentanyl given. And so really the, the big difference between getting fentanyl in a hospital versus on the street is the street, you're not going to know what dose it is. Right. At all. And so I remember when a lot of patients would come in and I had the opportunity to talk to them, I would ask them questions because I was curious on where are you actually getting the fentanyl? How is it, especially people that have been doing it for the last 20 years. (laughs) Which is mind blowing. Mind blowing. You can do it for that long and not die. Yeah. And so there are some people that (sighs) they, like I had this one guy, he's like, I make it myself and I haven't, I've been doing it for 40 years. And I'm like, you are a good chemist, my gosh, because most people would get scary. And it's, it's terrifying. And so the, the scary part about using fentanyl on the street is that you're not going to know what the dose is and your dose over time is going to change because of tolerance. So for example, if I gave, like I, I don't have an opiate use disorder. And if you gave me buprenorphine, a partial agonist that we actually use to help people get over their withdrawals, I would get high from it. Because my body is not used to having that. And partly, at least from a biochemical point of view, 
we get an increase in the number of receptors for the opiate. So your body's like, oh, I'm bound to this thing, which is the opiate. And I want to create more receptors so I can ultimately bind to more opiates. So there is a biochemical change to your body. Is that applicable to other addictions? To some extent. I'm not quite sure too much about the other ones. But that was one thing I found really fascinating. It's Your body is... It's, it's acting against itself. It's upregulating its receptors. Yeah. So it's, Jesus. So it's basically saying, cool, I have this. And this does it for a lot of other things in our body. Yeah. Um, it's just upregulation of protein synthesis. And the proteins ultimately make up the receptors. So, and, and again, like your body does this with a lot of things. And this is ultimately what tolerance is. And so over time, if you're using fentanyl or even just prescribed opiates from a doctor your body chemistry is going to change a little bit. And actually there's something that's terrifying that let's say you've been using any type, even a prescribed opiate, let's say you stop using it, you will actually get more increased pain later on in life. So your pain tolerance goes down. Jesus. As you're... Well, because that's like your body's not building up pain tolerance naturally, I'd imagine. Is that part of it? Yeah, part of it too. But it's it's this pretty intense, like people that are... Let's say like I had a, a guy come in and he had been using uh, street fentanyl for quite some time, about 10 years. And he came in and the amount of pain he was in from like a small little cut was exacerbated because his body was like, okay, you're, you're creating all these new receptors for these opiates here. It's going to change the way you perceive pain and you actually get an increased Fuck. amount of pain terrifying right it's utterly terrifying to me and Jesus. there's so many people and i'm seeing younger and younger i saw a 12 year old come in and the doctor like yeah it's not the youngest i've seen that had a pretty severe opiate use disorder so it's honestly it's ultimately terrifying to think about the numbers too they're exponentially growing yeah but i guess to f finish answering your, your initial question uh, with the fentanyl, it's not so much dose, but it's that you don't know the dose. So I could be, I uh, used to a really small dose and you give me a new fentanyl and it's too much for my body at that time. And I could die from that. Also the fact that it's mixed with all of these other things. And then right. what, what's scary too. And what I saw a lot of was you're incapacitated a lot of times when you are feeling these euphoric effects so I've seen people get taken advantage of physically. Yeah. Um, a lot of these people don't have things around them to protect their their belongings or their yeah. bodies. And so that's a really scary kind of a thought is that you are completely vulnerable while using these medications. And so that's something I don't think we talk about too much. Right. No, that's a good point. Um, you have a little bit of time left. Yeah. Which I hate working on a time limit, but <laughs> I, I promised myself that tonight I'm going to a fucking open mic and I'm going to go bomb, but I'm going to get the fucking reps in. Um, to end this on a lighter note, mm -hmm. what is, and I like, I don't know if he says off camera, but <clears throat> obviously this is not fucking medical advice. We're just discussing a subject. 100%. Um, getting off of opiate or getting off of opiates and away from addiction and then uh, recovery. In your time and experiencing patients that have, you know, dealt with that and had to get on that path, what are some common denominators amongst people who are managing to pull their life back together? Man, that is a great question. I think it depends on who you ask in terms of addiction medicine. There's a really great, and he's a Hungarian scientist, <laughs> but his name is Gabor Mate. And oh, does, that dude is the shit. Yeah, he knows my family. That <laughs> family friend. No, he's think, not. Yeah, so my, my no fucking way. My the, grandmother used to cook him, cook him Hungarian food. The dude that was on Rogan like yeah. six months ago. Yeah, no fucking way. Yeah. I, that dude has. I listened to his ep, listened. I listened to his episode when it first came out, and then every so often I'll throw it on when I go to sleep because his voice is so peaceful. Yeah, he's he's <laughs> he, got a really great great like, voice. If there, I would never spend money on cameo. But if he got on Cameo, you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could spend money for him to read me a bedtime story, I would. You got to read his books. 
I would. I've heard I've heard his books are really good. There's this one and it's I think it sums it up really well. Realm of Hungry Ghosts. That's a deathcore band. When you think oh really? <laughs> no, it should be. That sounds like a deathcore band. <laughs> it's I think that is a, a really profound way of looking at addiction is and and to answer your question about the common denominators, it's something that exists but also doesn't you have these it's kind of like the the hungry ghosts you have this thing outside of yourself this need this want this i would say more than a want this absolute necessity to have the fulfillment of whatever it is that you're addicted to and gabor mate talks a lot about the feeling of addiction i mean I don't blame some of these people for wanting to use substances when they come from a really difficult home and they have nothing really that, I mean, really rough. I was raised in a very privileged home and I had good parents and I didn't have to worry about where I got my food from or being safe or the fact that I had clothes on my back. I never had to worry about any of that. And for some people or just going through horrific events, um, I understand why they want to escape those mentally. And so that is where I think it feeds into that common denominator of doing better is what was the initial reason or what was the initial want to escape your reality. And for some people, it's just misfortune because they got prescribed opiates from a doc and they got addicted over time. And still too, why is it that you want that feeling? And so kind of moving away from just treating the body but then also saying okay i'm going to treat your physical symptoms but there's this mental aspect that we can't fully grasp like a ghost that is pulling you constantly towards this substance and so dealing with the ghost itself i think is the best way to ultimately stop using a substance right yeah i i see where that that train of thoughts coming from, but it becomes real, obviously at some point, because like what what we were just talking about, like your brain literally creates the receptors to want more of it. A hundred percent. That's, I, I, I never knew that. Like that's fucking crazy. Um, but I get the principle of what, of what he says and what he's talking about. It's kind of like, I think it's a little bit of both. Like you're going to have real effects and but like you said earlier, that's when you need to take care of that first and then you can like analyze the root cause. And I think in stopping overall using a substance, what's the purpose of the substance versus just the physical symptoms of the withdrawals? Like methamphetamines, there's there's no withdrawal symptoms. There's nothing that we can help them with for the withdrawal symptoms. Yeah, there are physical changes to your body, but you don't withdraw from meth, at least physically. There's nothing we can give you. If you come in, you're like, I haven't used meth and I'm I have these issues. There's nothing we can give you. Well, I was going to say, because, like, unfortunately, and this is a conversation, I think, for next time, if you ever want to come back. Um, but there's... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's two of my friends. Uh, we're not, unfortunately, not friends anymore because uh, of the life choices they made mm-hmm. um, from high school. And they got hooked on a meth fucking horribly. It's a rough drug. And I'd seen, I've seen one of them come down from it and then withdraw from it. And it's fucking crazy. Like little shaking, yeah, and and so I understand what you're saying. Like, there's nothing you can really do about it. You got to ride that shit out. Like, there's no Narcan for it, um, because meth is just a fucking vile thing that's made up of just ha- literally household substances and just terrifying. It's the dirtiest fucking shit out there. Terrifying. Um, but that's, I mean, I, I think that's a good way to look at it. Is get find a way to medicate and at least mitigate the physical symptoms and yeah. then start taking care of like okay where where did this come from where did the need come from where is the actual like root cause of the issue yeah and i think too uh i'm sorry for your friends that that was something that they had to go through and i mean you know how you know a lot of us are pretty upset of it or upset about it at the time but at the same time also that's their fucking choice mm-hmm. like and we and i can just say that from their experience like i literally watched the fucking 
uh progression yeah or i guess degression yeah. yeah like the spiral you know we a lot of us not a lot of us, but a few of us watched it in real time yeah and we we're like hey you probably fucking you probably shouldn't fucking smoke meth just saying yeah probably not a good idea and i'm like no it's fine literally i remember having a conversation with a friend of mine I said, no it's fine like, okay we're we're done then like i'll i'll be there for you if you need me but like we're not gonna see each other yeah right now because this is let me know when you want to actually get clean because I'm not being around this. Yeah. Like, fuck that. Like, I literally watched one of my best friends at the time. Uh, I, I watched, and I just, a highlight at the time, one of my closest friends, uh, I watched her fucking spark up in front of me. I'm like, oh all gosh. right. All right. We're done. I'm, yeah. I, I'm 18 and stupid, but I know what that is. We're just going to not do this. You want to hear something terrifying? I had a patient come in and I asked, well, when did you start using heroin? He said, for my 14th birthday, it was a gift from my mom. Jesus Christ. And the mom was, Ugh. she was using for a long time and she, she was there. And I was like, you started your 14 year old on here. And she goes, it was something for us to do together. That is when I heard that I, I did have to. Oh, you talked second. to the mom. Oh yeah. I talked, she was there. Okay. Yeah. So I have to ask, was the mom recovering at that point? Currently nope. using? They were both using. It's just. The the issue was, uh, she told me that they had a bad batch, and that her child, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. And I have to say, I had to take a second. I was like, okay, <laughs> I. <laughs> yeah, that's the issue. It that's wasn't cooked issue. properly. You're you're totally right. Yeah. The small the small Chinese immigrant that had to fucking bake that heroin for you fucking stirred it around a little bit too much with their dirty finger. Should have washed their hands. Yeah. Sorry. They're, oh, my God. My brother, he he told me once, he goes, I'm really glad you're going to be a doctor. I could never do that because I would go off on this mom. And that's the thing about being a provider that it's it's kind of a blessing in disguise. Like, you have a strict no hit policy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not always for the patient to the doctor. I've this had somebody hit me and oh, it I'm was sure. horrid. Oh, I'm sure. Come after me with a screwdriver and oh yeah, it, it gets my parents were very angry. I was in the ER. They were like, Okay, what what's going on this week? I'm like, Oh, someone tried to stab me. It's fine. That sounds but, about right. But I think my brother told me he goes, I couldn't just sit there and look at that. And I'm like, Well, that's what's nice about being a provider is we can we can treat no matter who you are. Right. And I don't have to get involved with the justification of do you deserve to be treated or do you deserve to just die? I don't have to make that decision because that would be way too much for me to make. Yeah. So I just treat everybody that comes in. But I, I did have to take a second when I'm sitting there and this teenage that ha they have been using for a couple of years, I believe the patient was 19 and the mom was there and just so nonchalant. Oh, it was a birthday present. Like, I, oh, it's a good thing. Like, I had a space to step away, and I said, I'll be right back. And then I could take my second, cry, like, punch the wall, and then I could go back in and say, okay, let's figure out what we're going to do. I'm just imagining that in, like, a newer episode of Scrubs. Like, oh, I, I forgot my paper. I'll be right back. And they go into the scream corner or the scream closet. They should absolutely have a scream <laughs> closet in the ER. I think that that would be so it's awesome. it's completely soundproof so no one can hear you. You should pitch and this you, to the hospital. And you get to yell all of the profane remarks <laughs> and four-letter words and insults and just whatever mad lib script you want to write for your brain. You've got like, you can clock in, or I got 30 seconds. And you just go right in these fucking, and you went, oh yeah, okay, yeah, 14th birthday, okay. <laughs> oh yeah tell me more yeah. okay my total wine delivery shows up at this yeah. time okay sounds good okay yeah. do you have any allergies <laughs> <laughs> any allergies to medications <laughs> motherfucker <laughs> that's why i aside <laughs> aside from my innate stupidity i could not be a doctor because i'd just be cracking jokes to their face you know if it makes you feel any better uh some of the darkest jokes i've ever heard er and the oncology clinic and I think you'd be great. You've ever okay. heard? Now you've made them. It's okay. I did. I made okay. one like two weeks into my rotation. And both the <laughs> attendings that heard it just looked at me. They said, you're going to do fine here. You're going like to do fine. It's like watching a middle school, uh, middle school cuss for the first time. It's like, oh, that, that's not exactly how you use the fuck word, but you're getting there. You're almost there, you're young almost Padawan. Like, keep yes. trying. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Oh, man. Well, this, I mean, I, I really do hate to cut this early, but this has been awesome. 
Thank you so much for having me. I, you're amazing to talk to, and I love listening to your podcast, so I'm happy to be on here. Well, thank you. And I'd love to do this again sometime in the near future. This 100%. This is a lot of fun. Uh, thank you again to Nat for suggesting you to me. She's the shit. Love you're you, baby awesome. girl. <laughs> you're awesome. Thank you again for coming by. Um, obviously, you came to talk about medical shit. I don't know if you have fucking social media shit you want to plug, but um, is that a... I have yeah. 110 followers on Instagram. <laughs> Boom. There you go. <laughs> I, I'm not normally on social media, yeah. but um, definitely listen to this podcast. <laughs> One of the best podcasts ever. I have to say, really interesting talks, and uh, he's got a great voice, so well, you got you. it. Thank you very much. Uh, I really don't want to do this again. This is a blast. Yeah, I look forward to it. Talk to y'all later. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. That was fun. That was so much fun.